Well, all right. I think that's going to be good enough as far as cleanup goes. Um, I guess I'll, I'll try and build this up with some TIG weld now. smell the ionized air from the high frequency and oh man that is some ugly tig weld well this is my first attempt and yeah, not pretty but you know what it's workable I was actually able to turn this area down here to a di diameter with only a couple of craters here and there I got some problems over here, and then out here, it just kind of almost, it's almost got like a taper to it already. <laughs> Problem is, I'm not ready for a taper yet. So, now that I clean this up, I'm going to go back and fill in some of these craters and then build up this end some more. But I got to let this cool down. This is holding quite a bit of heat. I contaminated my electrode, and I got to change it out again. I pre-sharpened several electrodes ahead of time because I knew I would probably dip them on more than one occasion, which I did. Um, but I'm actually going to change out the collet too, and I'm going to put in a larger electrode because um, I'm using eighth-inch filler wire, and I actually think I need to be using a larger electrode on this. So I'm using three thirty-seconds electrodes right now. Uh, so I'm going to step up to eighth-inch electrodes uh, to go with the eighth-inch filler wire. And I'm going to have to bump up my current. There's my second attempt after I turned it, and this is a lot better. Um, not long enough though, so I've got to add more on the end here.
All right, so I'm at the point now where I want to cut the taper on the uh, the new taper on that steering column. So my plan is I'm going to uh, use a test piece. I'm going to cut a taper on it, and I'm going to check the fit with a small test piece. And once I have the um, the fit that I like, I'm going to um, use that setting of my taper tapering jig on my lathe to then hopefully recreate that same taper on the steering column. But I'd like to know where to start, uh, so to speak, kind of close. So I'm back to trying to figure out what this taper is. And, you know, earlier I had played around with some measurements and thought that I kind of had an idea or a handle on it and didn't get very far. So I've been thinking about it and I think I've come up with an idea of how I might be able to measure the taper on this. So I don't have my big cast iron surface plate set up down here yet because I it's it's big and heavy and eventually I'm going to have a dedicated place for that and since I'm not ready for it yet that's still kind of stored away and it weighs a ton I'm not going to haul it up here on this bench temporarily so I'm using my old cast iron plate which um, I actually though for those of you who haven't seen this before I actually have no idea uh, what this was used for it's got all kinds of little um, what look like military nomenclature numbers so whatever company was using this they were using this as a jig because it's got threaded holes in various locations and stuff but it's got a really nice uh, flat surface relatively speaking and uh, it's got these adjustable feet and it's got three points of contact on the table so it can be leveled fairly easily anyways I'm going to use this as a makeshift surface plate and um, the plastic on the steering wheel the molding actually sticks out proud of the metal bushing that's inside here so what I've got underneath here right now is I actually have a crank pin uh, a piston pin from a uh, Detroit 353 diesel that I scrapped years ago and I saved some of the pins because they make good um, they're great for pushing in and out bearings on the press but they're hardened and they've got really good fine machine surfaces on them except for where it looked like there was a bad bearing on this one but anyways what I'm more concerned about is that the bottom surface that's on in contact with the plate right now is fairly parallel to the uh, top surface and so it's also the perfect diameter so that when I sit the steering wheel the way I'm sitting it now I should have this bushing should right now be fairly parallel to the surface of this plate so my first thought was well could I just use a surface gauge and put an indicator on it uh, but the problem is the way that this type of gauge uh, is designed this holder there's really no way to what I want to do is I want to be able to lower the indicator point down in the hole along the taper and keep it perfectly perpendicular to the plane of the top of the table so that's the only way I would get an accurate reading and I can't do that with something like this so ideally what I need is I need something like this height gauge okay so if I had this height gauge if I had a way to attach the uh, indicator to this height gauge what I would be able to do is two things I would be able to position this height gauge so that the uh, contact point was just touching the inside of the taper at the top here and then I would be able to lower this gauge exactly one inch and take a second measurement and then the idea is is I would have the two measurements one measurement one inch apart from the other measurement on that taper and then I would be able to use that to determine the taper 
I do not have a gauge like this that has a way for me to attach an indicator. So that's kind of a problem. So then I was thinking, well, what do I have for a gauge that would, might, might actually work in this situation? So I do have my nice big federal indicator uh, stand, which is, uh, you know, ideally this. Okay, so the problem with this stand is I'm not too worried about the fact that it's not graduated and doesn't show me the exact height because what I can do to overcome that is I can actually use my height gauge. I could actually use the height gauge on a surface like up here, okay, and I could set it up at the very top of the hole, take a measurement with the height gauge, then use the height gauge to drop this down exactly one inch, all right, which would be great. The problem is this is able to freely rotate along this around so it's not locked into a keyway or anything so there's no way to guarantee that when I loosen this to bring this down that it doesn't move a little bit this way and the slightest bit of movement over here is gonna telegraph out to be a huge amount of change over here alright so that's not gonna work there's no way I'm gonna be able to loosen this up and think for a minute I'm going to be able to drop this down exactly one inch without messing with this going in and out the tiniest bit and throwing off of my throwing off my measurements so that's out so then I thought well maybe I could figure a way to clamp the mount for one of my indicators to the side of this scriber that's on this thing all right and then once I get it in position if I make sure that I don't move the base at all and I just bring it down one inch from my start position and then take the second measurement that should work that seemed like a plausible idea unfortunately I, I have several indicators that have little dovetail attachments none of them are wide enough to fit on here so it's not like I could just kind of slide a dovetail one on here and then maybe temporarily clamp it in place with a very small machinist clamp or something like that. I could try and just clamp it right to the side. I kind of worry about that moving though and not being secure. So the best thing would be for me to actually maybe mill a small block that I could actually put in here um, or at least a small block that would give me the ability to clamp to this better and then have a hole for the stem on one of my indicators. So I was thinking about getting ready to make one of those. So then that turns into a whole another one of these. Oh, all right. Now we're turning into another mini project just to get where we want to go. And then it occurred to me. What I want is I want something that has a flat surface and something that has a column that can be brought up or down and stays perpendicular to the flat surface and I thought wait a minute I've got that I've got that right here in the shop the mill I can mount an indicator easily in a collet in the quill and I know that my quill because I've trammed the head um, so I know that the quill is perpendicular to the table surface and because I have a precision vice on there the reality is it's actually also perpendicular to that surface on top of the vice in other words this um, spindle is perpendicular to this flat surface on top of the vice right here so if I use this surface right here the way I was using the surface plate over there and put an indicator in here I should be able to do the exact same measurement that I just was trying to do over there and with a lot more ease. All right, so here's my setup. Um, those of you who have watched my video series I did on my indicators uh, know that I have quite a few different indicators I can choose from as far as uh, DTIs go. And I mentioned in that series about how the 
one of the things that the last word, stare at last word indicators, really has going for it that the other indicators can't, uh, can't handle as well is the fact that they have a long, skinny nose that can reach down into a situation like this. I mean, for accuracy and quali quality, you can't beat, you know, like the Interrapids and say, for instance, this Tessa test. But uh, you can see this nose, this part right here is pretty large on this indicator compared to this stare at last word. Here's a side view. Um, I'm using this attachment right here just because it, uh, it fits in the collet perfectly that I happen to grab and rather than find a shorter one I just kind of dog like this and that's not going to really affect anything uh, I've got the spindle locked so I don't have to worry about this rotating and changing my reading because of sweeping on the inside of that curve or arc so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, engage my fine feed on the uh, on the quill and I've lined up the zero on that little vernier scale with the zero right over here now I'm going to use the knee elevation to bring the table up and uh, I'm going to just get that ball right below that very top edge there. Now I've uh, moved the dial over a little bit so that when I bring the y-axis, actually, when I bring the y-axis forward, it'll start to hit the ball. And I've got this backwards, don't I? Yep. <laughs> oh, that's okay. You know what? I can indicate the back edge. Actually, I think I'll bring this back. There we go. All right. I don't know if you can see that. So since this is the back side of the steering wheel, this is the larger diameter. So that means as I lower the quill down into the hole, the hole is going to get smaller, and that's going to cause the uh, indicator to be pushed, This the arm on the indicator to be pushed inward towards the center. I am now going to use the hand wheel to feed this and what I'm going to do is I'm going to feed this down and all right so now I've got to readjust that arm what's happened is the body of the nose the indicator is hitting so I've just got to um, just going to adjust that arm so it sticks out a little further. All right, let's try this again. All right, that's 200 and it's almost 250 thousandths right there. Not just about. And I have gone 11 thousandths. So at uh, half an inch, I would expect it to go 22. All right, that's, that's 500 thousandths right there. And I've actually gone, oh no, that's 22. Okay, so I didn't go past, I don't know why I thought that. That would be past. So yeah, you can see I'm almost, well, I don't know, from this angle, you, but the, the needle is right before the 22. So it's right where I expected it to be, all right? Now, ideally, I would keep going down the hole, and at one inch, I would hopefully see 44 thousandths. The problem is that this indicator is limited to one revolution. So, let's see, what did I say? There was uh, 11 thousandths for the first quarter inch. Let's see if I can get, I've got enough dial left here for, no, not really. I was going to say, can I get another 11 thou, but I can't. See, what's going to happen is if I keep going down the hole, I can only get to there and then it stops because I've basically reached the limit of the indicator. Let's see, that's 11 thousandths. That should be, yeah, that's about a quarter of an inch. Yep. Actually, that's 22 on the dot this time. So 22 thousandths over half an inch, which would or should be. 44 thousandths per inch. So there's a couple of different ways we can measure a taper on a bore. So if we're looking at the side view of that hub, okay, what we've got, I'm going to exaggerate the taper here 
for the purposes of our discussion. But we've basically we've got a tapered hole. All right, so we've got a diameter on this side that's larger than a diameter on this side, and this diameter is decreasing at a constant rate as we travel down this bore in this direction. Okay? So, what we could do is we could actually measure the um, diameter at this opening here and then measure the diameter one inch along this center line okay and that would we could actually extrapolate that we could end up getting the taper per foot but the interesting thing here is what we're really what we're really gonna capitalize on is the fact that we've got some right triangle t trigonometry going on here in actuality what we've got if we were to continue this eventually these two lines come together and what we end up with is we end up with a point right here where these two lines are going across the imaginary center line okay and you'll notice that once we do that we actually end up with two right triangles okay so to find the taper per foot when we know the two diameters the diameter at one end of the bore and the diameter at the other end of the bore what we do is we subtract the small diameter from the large diameter then we divide by the length of the taper so the distance from here to here and then we multiply that quotient by 12 and that gives us taper per foot or we could leave it just the way it is and we have taper per inch if you think about it what we're really doing is the distance from here to here is equal to the distance from here to here plus if we had a parallel line coming across here and a parallel line coming across here this little section and this little section okay of these two other right triangles all right so you add this little section to this diameter to this little section and you get this diameter with me so far all right so the beauty is by doing my little experiment there on the mill i know that over one inch this length right here ends up being 44 thousandths now I'm gonna double this because I've got another 44 thou that's happening on this side got it and I'm gonna end up with 88 thousandths and this 88 thousandths mind you would be what I would end up with if I took the diameter at the opening where I started and subtracted from it the diameter down inside here after I travel down the bore one inch with the indicator. I end up with 0.088 left over. This diameter minus that unknown diameter would give me 0.088. I divide that because I only went down exactly one inch. I divide that by one. That makes the math real easy. I end up with 0 0.088. And that is my taper per inch. And if I multiply this by 12, I end up with 1.056. And that's my taper per foot. Now here's an, a handy uh, online calculator at a company, uh, at a website called magafor.com. And basically what they do is they give you a little online taper calculator and you can plug in two of the three parameters and you'll get whatever the missing parameter is. Uh, for instance, I'm sorry, three. Well, <laughs> you'll see what I mean in a minute. All right, so in our example here, uh, doesn't matter that we don't know this diameter we know what the rate of change is over one inch 
So I can plug in any hypothetical along this imaginary cone as it expands, any hypothetical uh, location. But let's just, for the sake of argument, let's pretend that this is a two-inch diameter at the uh, at the opening here. So I'm going to put in uh, two. All right, for D, L is the length along here, and we decided to use one inch. So again, we're just picking this cross section right here at the one inch point. So I know L is going to be one inch, okay, and D down here, okay, this is this small diameter. Now we don't know what the small diameter is yet, but we know that if we take that large diameter and we subtract from it that rate of change calculation I came up with times two, we're gonna end up with that small diameter. So if I take two inches and I take 0 0.088 away from it, end up with 1.912, if I plug in 1.912. Now I have my, all right, cone angle is the angle from here to here. And what we're looking at is a taper of 8.8%. So what if this diameter was one inch? Well, then we go back to our calculator and we start with one inch and we subtract, again, the 0 0.088. We end up with 0 0.912. And we stick 0 0.912 in here. And we should end up with, ta-da, again, 8.8%. This does not change. Because it's a constant, it's the constant um, rate of change, so to speak, as we move down this bore. It's not a curve. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> so, doesn't matter what the heck this diameter is and this diameter is, really. As long as we know that as we go down this bore, that wall is kind of getting smaller and smaller by a diameter of 0 0.088 inches per inch of, of travel down the bore, okay? So... Even if I had this huge bore and it was 12 inches, 12 inches, and we're going to subtract, again, our 0 0.088, we're going to 11.912. And if I put 11.912 in here, 8.8. .8. We could even go one step further. Do you remember that I wasn't able to go down the bore an entire inch? I actually just doubled what I ended up with at the half inch mark. Does anybody remember what that was? So again, let's use our hypothetical diameter of two inches. This time though, we're going to say that we've only gone down the bore half an inch, 0.5, and this diameter at this end is going to be, when I went down the bore half an inch, I moved 11 thousandths. I'm sorry, 20, 22 thousandths. And we're going to take the 22 thousandths, and remember, that's half of this distance that we're looking for, the difference. That's half of the difference between the starting diameter and the ending diameter. So we're going to put in here 0 0.044. Okay? And when we calculate... Something very horribly wrong happens. We end up with 391.2. What happened there? Hold on a second. Let me check my math. Oh, <laughs> I put point zero. <laughs> All right, hold on. Uh, we want two inches minus point zero four four. Scared myself there for a minute. All right, so two inches minus point zero four four equals one point nine five six. So here we're gonna put one point nine. 5, 6, 8.8 again. 2 at half inches, at a half an inch, at a quarter of an inch, it was 11 thousandths, right? 
So we could change this to 0 0.250. And this is going to become, take that 11 thousandths, we double it, that's 22 thousandths. Two inches minus 0 0.022, 1.978, 1.978. Voila, 8.8%. So see, it doesn't matter whether or not it was over a quarter of an inch, a half an inch, or an inch. We could just keep going. But what we've got is we've got an 8.8% taper. Now if I go back and I use my stare at taper gauges, and I put this one in the large end, and I can see that it's uh, 802 thousandths. So we're going to use the large diameter is going to be 0 0.802. Flip this over. It looks like that's going to be 718. And now I want to get the overall length of the taper. So I'm just going to stick this socket underneath there so I have a little shelf for this. So we're just going to call it 1.2 inches. Now we go back to our original formula for uh, taper per inch which is the large diameter, 0 0.802, minus the small diameter, 0 0.718, which gives us 0 0.084, divided by the length of the taper, 1.2, gives us 0 0.07 taper per inch. A little bit less than the 0 0.088 we ended up with before interesting. I'm going to go back to that website and plug it in to the online calculator and we're going to end up with 0 0.802 for the major diameter, 0 0.718 for the minor diameter over a length of 1.2 inches. That gives us a dead-on 7% taper. Interesting. 7% is interesting because 7% is a common taper, 7 and 100 ratio. 8 is 2 and 25. 8.8 .8 is closest to 9, which is 9 and 100. So that's, I really wish that worked out better. I use my snap gauges to try and get a more accurate reading on these bores, uh, the uh, diameters at each end. And I ended up uh, coming up 0 0.085, which changed this number a little bit, and 0 0.715, which changed this number a little bit, which changed the overall calculation. It brought this 7% up to about 7.5%. So... That's still 1% away, over 1% away from the 8.8 .8 I was getting over here. But I think I know enough now to know that I'm in the 7 to 9% range is where I need to be. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and cut a taper. I'm going to try and cut a taper around 8% and test fit.